Chapter 1131. Benevolent Hall. It was a name that was ordinary as ordinary could be. The Red Cross symbol on the sign indicated that this was a medicine shop, and this was a medium-sized shop that wasn't too small, nor particularly large. Everything about the shop was completely mundane and unremarkable. Tang Wulin entered through the door, and there weren't many customers inside. There were also only three or four staff members, and the rows of shelves were filled with all types of common medicines. Tang Wulin walked through the aisles between the shelves and quickly chose a few packs of medicine before making his way over to the counter. The employee standing behind the counter glanced at the medicinal ingredients that had been placed before him, and his expression immediately changed slightly. He looked up at Tang Wulin in a slightly surprised manner and said, "Sir, the medicines you're purchasing aren't concurrent with any condition. Are you sure this is what you want?" Tang Wulin smiled and said, "I'm not buying these medicines to treat any conditions. I'm just purchasing them for consumption." The employee hurriedly said, "All medicines are poisoned to a certain extent." How can you treat them as food? Tang Wuling replied, It's alright, I have a good appetite. The employee nodded and said, Alright, please come with me. Our on-site doctor will be able to provide you with better advice. The conversation between the two of them seemed to be rather farcical, but it was actually a string of secret signals. The sequence had commenced as soon as Tang Wuling had carried those specific medicines to the counter. Tang Wuling followed the employee through a door, and the employee remained completely silent as he led Tang Wuling to the second floor. There was an elevator on the second floor, and the elevator only had two buttons, one for the second floor, and one for the third floor. However, the employee ignored the buttons and began to tap against the metal wall on one side of the elevator. After several dozens of rhythmic taps, an option for the negative second floor appeared on the electronic screen. The elevator descended before the door opened, and the employee made an inviting hand gesture toward Tang Wuling before walking out of the elevator first. Even though they were currently situated two floors underground, the lighting here was still very bright, and after passing through a passageway, they arrived at a spacious underground room. There were many people busy at work in this room, and they seemed to be putting some things together. With Tang Wuling's eyesight, he was immediately able to tell that the things they were putting together were all related to mega parts. Furthermore, there were all parts for high-grade mechas, as well as some core equipment. He didn't ask any questions and continued to maintain his silence. He was led to another room by the employee, and there was a middle-aged man sitting in the room who was just as mundane looking as Tang Wuling in his disguised form. The first generation of the Tang sect had seven monsters. Which monster are you? Tang Wuling smiled and pulled out an item before handing it over to the middle-aged man. I am the third one. The first generation of Shrek's seven monsters had founded the Tang sect, but the main founder wasn't the eldest one among Shrek's seven monsters at the time. Instead, it was the third oldest monster, Tang San. Prior to his departure from the Blood God Legion base, Heartless Dilworth Kaldaja had given Tang Wuling some things, all of which would be used at the Tang sect secret bases that were littered throughout the continent. Each base had a different set of secret signals, and none of the bases knew of the existence of the other secret bases. Only the truly high ranking members of the Tang sect were aware of the locations of these secret bases. The token that Tang Wuling was currently offering belonged to the Dulu Palace. It was a rhomboid badge that wasn't very large, and the words Tang San were engraved on one side, while the words Tang sect were engraved on the other side. Tang sect, Tang San. For some reason, Tang Wuling was always struck by a peculiar feeling at the side of his name, as if his name was somehow extremely closely connected to him. The middle aged man accepted the badge, and he only took a single glance at it before immediately rising to his feet with a surprised expression. He then hurriedly strode over to a device before inserting the badge into it. A light screen quickly appeared, upon which the image of a longsword was being depicted. Engraved on the sword were the words the heartless one denies his innermost feelings. But he was once a man who was filled with passion. The text on the longsword then flashed seven times in quick succession on the light screen. Seven flashes indicates a presence equivalent to that of the palace master himself. After extricating the badge from the device, the middle-aged man's expression had completely changed as he turned to Tang Wuling in a respectful manner. GG. The manager of the Tang Sect's Bright City Branch pays his respects to the esteemed envoy. The badge that Kao Daja had given him was a Dulu Palace badge of the highest level, and with this badge, he had the right to draw upon all of the Tang Sect's resources. Even this manager was only seeing a badge of this level for the first time. Ever since the Tang Sect headquarters had been destroyed by the God Slayer Soul Missile, the Tang Sect had always kept a low profile, and all of its major branches had withdrawn significantly. Even so, they were still being severely oppressed from all sides. As such, the arrival of Tang Wuling with the highest level Dulu Palace badge immediately struck this branch manager with a sense of elation. Tang Wuling appraised the man standing before him to find that he was quite tall and broad with fair skin and a slightly chubby figure. He wore a bashful smile on his face and appeared to be completely harmless. Tang Wuling accepted the badge and asked, There's no need for such formalities. I'm just here to learn about the current situation in Bright City, especially after the parliamentary reform. Do you have a detailed list of names of all of the new parliamentary members? I do. Please give me a moment. GG did things very quickly, and soon, a list of names was being offered to Tang Wuling. The federal parliament makes decisions on all matters across the entire federation, and the president is the one who holds the highest level of political power in the federation. But even the president is restricted by the entire federal parliament. On the surface, this looks like a very fair system of power, but in reality, the federation is very corrupt, and many of the parliamentary seats are occupied by the various major powers. Ever since the continent was united around 10,000 years ago and was renamed to become the Dulu Federation, the federal parliament system was adopted, and in the beginning, it really did help the Federation develop at a phenomenal rate. However, as time passed and exchanges of benefits took place between all sides, all of the major powers began to infiltrate the parliament, and what was formerly a fair and open system gradually took a more sinister turn. As things currently stand, the referendum no longer holds any sway over the final decisions made by the federal parliament, and all decisions are made based on whichever power holds the most parliamentary seats. Following the Shrek City bombing, the Federation was dealt an extremely heavy blow, and the parliament was temporarily abolished, while the president at the time abdicated himself. This provided an opportunity for all of the major powers to completely transform the power balance within the parliament, and over two thirds of the current parliamentary members were recently newly elected. Tang Wuling interjected, Brother G, I'm not particularly familiar with the structure of the federal parliament. Can you provide me with a more detailed explanation, including the differences between the parliamentary factions? Ji Ji nodded and continued. There are a total of 231 seats in the federal parliament, which equates to 231 parliamentary members. This number was decided on after many alterations were made, and each and every one of the parliamentary members were elected by different areas. The larger cities naturally had more members, while the smaller cities received less representation. These 231 parliamentary members comprise the entire federal parliament, and 42 presidium members are chosen among them to make decisions on daily federal affairs. It can be said that these 42 presidium members comprise the standing committee. The presidium includes a president, as well as 15 vice presidents and 26 members. This presidium holds the most power of any organization in the entire federation. Tang Wuling was rather surprised to hear this. There are that many vice presidents. Ji Ji nodded in response. The large number of vice presidents is necessary in order to balance all of the major powers. Super organizations like the Spirit Pagoda and Battle God Hall each have a permanent vice president birth, as do our Tang Sect and Shrek Academy. However, Shrek Academy relinquished this birth around 6,000 years ago and chose to continue to uphold absolute neutrality. As for our Tang Sect's birth, it has been revoked during this parliamentary reform. A slightly indignant expression appeared on Ji Chi's face as he mentioned the unjust treatment directed toward the Tang Sect. In summary, the 231 parliamentary members, which included 42 presidium members, comprised the core of the entire federation. Tang Wuling committed all of this information to memory. Chapter 1132. Ji Chi continued, the federal parliament has always been split up into two major factions, the Eagle faction and the Dao faction. There is also a neutral faction, but that faction has
colonies. Their thought process is that no one knows if other life forms exist in outer space and whether they're powerful or not. So who knows if we'll encounter resistance in our attempt to settle onto new planets? In any case, both sides have valid arguments, as well as their own groups of loyal supporters. A contemplative look appeared on Tang Wuling's face. Let me guess, the Spirit Pagoda supports the Eagle faction, while our Shrek Academy and Tang Sect support the Dove faction, right? Ji Chi nodded in response. Indeed. In the past, our Tang Sect and Shrek Academy have always supported the Dove faction, even though the Academy withdrew from the Federal Parliament later on. It has connections all over the entire continent, not just in the Dove faction, but some of the core members of the Eagle faction had also come from our Academy. This is why our Academy has always remained a neutral entity. Conversely, the most direct supporters of the Eagle faction are the Spirit Pagoda and the Battle God Hall. It can be said that they are the main pillars of the Eagle faction. The general public was normally more inclined towards supporting the Dove faction as they didn't want to see wars and excessive resource depletion, so the Dove faction held the upper hand in the Federal Parliament the vast majority of the time. However, the Shrek City bombing changed all that, and the Dove faction is now struggling to keep the Eagle faction in check. Not only did the terrorist attack destroy Shrek Academy, our Tang Sect has also been dealt an extremely heavy blow, and the Eagle faction has seized the initiative to spread controversy and propaganda, using the general public sphere of the Holy Spirit cult to catapult themselves to the lead. During this parliamentary reform, the Eagle faction claimed over 110 seats, and even most of the members of the neutral faction have sided with them, thereby giving them an absolute advantage. As things are right now, it's already very difficult for the Dove faction to sway the current political situation. Tang Wuling's mind began to race rapidly after hearing Ji Chi's explanation. There were a lot of things that could be deduced from the current state of the federal parliament. The power that had benefited the most from the disaster that had befallen Shrek Academy and the Tang sect was undoubtedly the Federation's Eagle faction, and the main supporters of the Eagle faction were the Spirit Pagoda and the Battle God Hall. There was no concrete proof, cementing a connection between them and the Holy Spirit cult, but it was an undeniable fact that they had benefited from this horrendous tragedy. Furthermore, even if they hadn't directly assisted the Holy Spirit cult, was everyone really expected to believe that they didn't at least turn a blind eye to the situation? One had to realize that the Spirit Pagoda headquarters was virtually within a stone's throw away from Shrek City, and compared to the Tang Sect, the Spirit Pagoda was an even more powerful organization. So why hadn't the two Godslayer missiles targeted Shrek City and the Spirit Pagoda rather than Shrek City and the Tang Sect? If that had been the case, then an even heavier blow would have been dealt to the entire continent. Just this factor alone made it impossible not to suspect the Spirit Pagoda of foul play. Tang Wuling's eyes narrowed slightly, and his aura had also changed. Ji Chi handed a list over to Tang Wuling and said, "This is a roster. Blue represents the Dove faction, red represents the Eagle faction, and white represents the Neutral faction." From the colors on the list, it was quite apparent that the Eagle faction held an absolute upper hand. Just the Eagle faction alone had close to 50% of all of the parliamentary seats. Tang Wuling mused, "It doesn't seem like there's too much of a disparity. The Dove faction also has over 80 seats, so if we can garner the support of the Neutral faction, it doesn't work like that." Ji Chi hurriedly interjected, "You can't just look at the number of parliamentary." seats each faction possesses. The final result of the election depends on the level of support the factions receive from the general public, and the faction that receives the most support will be in power for the next five years. Only very rarely has there ever been such a huge disparity between the number of parliamentary seats owned by the two major factions. This essentially means that the Dove faction won't be able to turn the tables for a very long time in the future. The Eagle faction is very smart in the way it goes about spreading its agenda. The faction has always been in support of waging wars, but they're insisting that the wars will take place on foreign land, and at the same time, they've stated that they'll do everything in their power to ensure the safety of their soldiers. This, in addition to the devastating terrorist attacks from the Holy Spirit cult during the past few years, has raised the support for the Eagle faction to over 65%, which is an all-time record high. Tang Wuling nodded in response. I see. He inspected the list of names in his hand as he spoke, and the vast majority of names on the list were completely unfamiliar to him. There was only the occasional familiar name, such as Yue Sang Yu's grandfather, who represented the Southern Legion. He was a member of the Eagle faction, as well as a member of the Presidium, but not a vice president. There was no representation for the Blood God Legion in the Federal Parliament, and that was most likely due to the relatively independent nature of the Legion. None of the names in the Tang sect that he was familiar with were included on the list, and it was as if they had been completely wiped out. This was a clear indication of just how far the Federal Parliament was going to oppress the Tang sect. It seems like the Parliament is targeting us quite heavily. Tang Wuling used in a grave voice. A wry smile appeared on Ji Chi's face. This has always been the case. In reality, even as far back as when the Duluo Federation was first founded, our Tang sect has always sided with the Star Luo Empire. If it weren't for us, the Star Luo Empire would have been destroyed long ago. At the time, the Mighty figure spirit Ice Duluo Huo Yuai restricted the Sun Moon Empire, which was the previous form of the Duluo Federation, all on his own to save the Star Luo Empire. As such, our status is loftier over in the Star Luo Empire than that of the Spirit Pagoda. Of course, the Spirit Ice Duluo was the one who had founded the Spirit Pagoda in the first place, but the Spirit Pagoda is no longer the same organization that he had first created. Tang Wuling nodded in response. He had been to the Star Luo Empire, so he was well aware of this. Even Dragon King Wang Yue belonged to the Tang Sect over there. The Tang Sect was by far the most powerful organization in the Star Luo Empire, and this was quite fortunate as it meant that the Tang Sect still had ample resources and influence elsewhere. Back when Shrek Academy first decided to support our Tang Sect, the Federal Parliament had been very displeased, but they couldn't do anything about it. Those politicians of the Federal Parliament have been itching to adopt oppressive measures against us for a long time, but they were unable to as the Academy was too powerful, and our headquarters was situated in Shrek City. However, they've taken advantage of the Holy Spirit cult's terrorist attack to try to bring down our Tang Sect in its entirety. On this continent, our Tang Sect is almost being viewed as an illegal organization. Tang Wuling chuckled coldly. Are they trying to clear out all potential obstacles in their plan to wage war against the Star Luo Empire? They're afraid that we're going to alert the Star Luo Empire of their plans in advance, right? Ji Chi nodded in response. That's a very plausible notion. Hence, our forces are being oppressed and ostracized to a very severe extent in the military, and many of them have already been falsely prosecuted based on slanderous claims. The situation is currently extremely bad. Tang Wuling could imagine that the situation had to be extremely complex, but in any case, the Tang Sect was clearly only receiving such treatment as its ideology clashed with those who were in power. Compared to the Spirit Pagoda, the Tang Sect had always been quite understated and kept a low profile. As such, the general public wasn't even aware of the fact that the sect was being oppressed by all sides. Tang Wuling continued to read over the list of names as he listened to Ji Chi's analysis, and when he reached the Dove faction section of the list, he suddenly saw a very familiar name. Hmm. Why is she on the list? Tang Wuling pointed to a name that was highlighted in blue with a surprised look on his face. Mo Lan. This was a name that Tang Wuling was naturally extremely familiar with. She was a trained conductor who had been willing to sacrifice herself for her passengers, and in the end, she had almost perished, but was thankfully saved by Holy Spirit Duluo Yali. After that, Heaven Do City was struck by a terrorist attack from the Holy Spirit cult, and Tang Wuling was also dealing with issues on his own end. He had attempted to contact Mo Lan at the time, but was unable to connect to her original number. Who would have thought that this familiar name would be on this list? He couldn't help but wonder if this Mo Lan really was the Mo Lan that he knew. Chapter 1133. A surprised expression appeared on Tang Wuling's face. You're referring to her. She's a bright new political star for the Dove faction. Come to think of it, she has quite a tragic backstory. She
had perished, and even Molan's husband and child had also. Just how much pain did she have to go through? Tang Wolin's hands reflexively balled up into tight fists. All of these accursed evil soul masters deserved the most painful of deaths. Tang Wolin had never been so enraged in his life. He forcibly repressed his emotions and asked, "What happened after that?" Ji Ji replied, "After that, this Molan became an extremely revered figure in Heaven Do City, especially among the general public. During the parliamentary reform, she became the representative for Heaven Do City and also one of the youngest Dove faction parliamentary members. At the same time, she became the deputy mayor of Heaven Do City. The current mayor of Heaven Do City is also a vice president. So it ends. Molan is actually taking care of most of the matters in the city. It's said that she's currently in a very strange state. Aside from sleeping, all of her time is dedicated to her work, and it seems that she's trying to numb her pain and grief through overworking. The more Tang Wolin heard, the more forlorn and enraged he became. Where is she right now? Is she in Heaven Do City or Bright City? Tang Wolin asked. Ji Ji replied, the federal parliament is holding its third plenary meeting soon, so she should currently be in Bright City. The main topic of discussion during this meeting will be about waging war against the Star Lua Empire. Tang Wolin raised an eyebrow upon hearing this. Can you find out where she's staying? Ji Ji replied, I should be able to. However, due to how rampant the Holy Spirit cult has been recently, all of the parliamentary members are receiving very high levels of protection. So even if we find out where she's staying, you may not be able to meet her anyway. Do you recognize Ms. Molan? Tang Wolin nodded in silence as a wry smile appeared on his face. Sister Molan, how are you? Tang Wolin emerged from the underground Tang sect base with a heavy heart. He had benefited greatly from this trip as he had learned a lot about the continent's current overall situation. Yet he had also learned about the tragedy that had struck Molan. After getting into a soul taxi, he instructed the driver to take him to the Bright City Blacksmith Association. No matter how tight the security was, he had to find a way to meet Molan, just to offer her some consolation, if nothing else. Tang Wolin was quite confident in his ability to bypass any security measures. The Bright City Blacksmith Association was no smaller than the Blacksmith Association headquarters, which was situated in Heaven Do City. This made sense, seeing as this was the federal capital, and the demand for high-grade metals was extremely high here. However, as soon as Tang Wolin walked into the Blacksmith Association building, he discovered that there was barely anyone around. Wasn't the Blacksmith Association here supposed to be a lively and bustling place? There were relatively few people who chose to pursue forging as their occupation, but even so, there was no lack of blacksmiths, especially low-grade and mid-grade ones. There were many blacksmiths that were below the third rank who weren't even soul masters, and they relied solely on their skills and expertise to earn themselves a living. After all, the metals they forged could definitely be used for the construction of ordinary methods. However, the massive first floor of the Blacksmith Association building was currently extremely sparsely populated, and there were no more than 10 blacksmiths present. The building was made to look especially spacious as a result, and there weren't even that many employees around. What was going on? Tang Wolin strayed over to a desk with befuddlement in his heart, and the employee behind the desk immediately stood up. Hello, are you a blacksmith or would you like to release a mission? Tang Wolin replied, I'm a foreign blacksmith who's only just arrived in Bright City. What's happened here? Why is there barely anyone here? A wry smile appeared on the employee's face. All of the blacksmiths have been conscripted to the military with high wages on offer. Did you not receive a conscription order? Due to the fact that wars would break out at any time, the military is conscripting all blacksmiths, and especially favorable terms are being offered to blacksmiths of the fifth rank or below. The military is willing to provide a vast amount of uncommon medals to these blacksmiths, which is naturally a very attractive offer for those trying to achieve spirit refinement for the first time. As such, there are very few blacksmiths on the first floor here. In contrast, the terms being offered by the military aren't as attractive to blacksmiths above the fifth rank, so all of the high-grade blacksmiths are on higher floors. Tang Wolin was rather surprised to hear this. Isn't the parliament still deciding whether they're going to wage war or not? Why are they conscripting blacksmiths already? A cold smile appeared on the employee's face. The decision has already been made, and they've been mobilizing troops for a long time already. One of my friends is currently serving in the military, and he told me that they're already mobilizing everyone toward the East Sea. The parliament is only following some formalities to make the decision more official. Tang Wolin's brows furrowed upon hearing this. Was the situation this bad already? The Eagle faction really was keen to take up arms. A war would be beneficial to his endeavor to revive Shrek Academy as it would buy him a lot of time, but he really didn't want to see this happen. It couldn't really be said that he was very fond of the Star Lua Empire, but the fact of the matter was that everyone was human and lived on the same Dolores Star. If a war were to break out, countless people would undoubtedly lose their lives. All right, thank you for the introduction. Can I still take on any forging missions now? Preferably some high-level ones if they're available. Tang Wolin asked. Of course. We have mountains of forging missions that are waiting to be completed. If you're a third rank or fourth rank blacksmith, then there's virtually an endless number of missions for you to complete. Would I be able to see your blacksmith badge? Tang Wolin smiled and pulled out his blacksmith badge before pinning it to his own chest. The badge was golden in color with seven shimmering black stars on its surface. The employee was completely flabbergasted at the sight of this badge, and she exclaimed, "You're a seventh rank Saint Blacksmith." In the blacksmith world, one's badge indicated their rank as well as their status. Even in a large branch like the one in Black City, Saint Blacksmiths were extremely rare. The badge colors of blacksmiths followed this template. Expert blacksmiths possessed blue badges with one or two white stars. Master blacksmiths possessed orange badges with three or four yellow stars. Grandmaster blacksmiths possessed white badges with five or six purple stars. Saint blacksmiths possessed golden badges with seven or eight black stars. Finally, divine blacksmiths possessed platinum badges with nine red stars. Tang Wolin's badge instantly revealed the fact that he was a Saint Blacksmith, which meant that he was capable of soul refinement. He was an extremely rare commodity, even in the context of the entire continent. Why was it that there were far fewer three-word battle armor masters on the continent than two-word battle armor masters? This wasn't because two-word battle armor masters weren't able to cultivate to the extent that they were powerful enough to become three-word battle armor masters. Instead, it was because there was simply a severe shortage of Saint Blacksmiths, and they simply didn't have enough time to forge so many suits of three-word battle armor. Suits of three-word battle armor had extremely high metal requirements, and if one were to fail in the forging process, then they would have to start again from scratch. As such, many two-word battle armor masters refrained from upgrading their suits of battle armor unless they had a sufficient economic foundation. Hence, all Saint Blacksmiths were extremely revered on the continent, and almost all of them were Blacksmith Association branch residents. Chapter 1130. Beautiful. Even though the employee didn't recognize this mundane looking middle aged man, his badge was irrefutable proof of his identity. No one would dare fabricate a seven star Saint Blacksmith badge. The Blacksmith Association didn't possess as lofty a status as that of the Mecca Association. But the president of the Blacksmith Association was a parliamentary member. That's right, Divine Blacksmith Sen Hua was a parliamentary member, and on top of that, he was a member of the Presidium. He was also one of the familiar names that Tang Wolin had seen on the list, and he was one of the leaders of the neutral faction. My apologies, I didn't know you were a Saint Blacksmith. The employee didn't dare to chastise Tang Wolin for not wearing his badge to begin with. In reality, if it hadn't been for the fact that there was barely anyone on this floor, Tang Wolin wouldn't have put on his badge. Otherwise, he'd definitely be scrutinized like an endangered animal in a zoo. It's alright, there's no need to be nervous. I'm just here to do some missions. Which floor do I need to go to? The employee virtually jogged around from behind the counter. And said, I'll take you there. That's a Saint Blacksmith. I heard that the federal military is contacting all blacksmiths, hoping that they'll participate in the upcoming war, and they're offering extremely handsome rewards, including the newly synthesized Black Soul Spirits from the Spirit Pagoda. I w
even more valuable. As such, virtually all soul masters had to be affiliated with the spirit pagoda to a certain extent. For example, if the spirit pagoda were to refuse to sell soul spirits to a certain soul master, then that would undoubtedly severely hamper their future cultivation. This was most likely an issue that he would have to face in his plight to rebuild Trek Academy. He took the elevator all the way to the fourth floor, and there were even fewer people on this floor than on the first floor. There wasn't even a spacious hall. There were only a series of passageways. Tang Walin had deduced that this was most likely where the highest level forging rooms in the association branch were situated. Saint blacksmiths were extremely rare, and even in a branch as large as Bright Cities, there were definitely not more than three Saint blacksmiths among their ranks. A beautiful young woman had already risen to her feet and made her way over to Tang Walin with a smile on her face. Greetings, esteemed Saint blacksmith. Is there anything I can assist you with? It was undoubtedly the case that she had already been notified of Tang Walin's identity. I want to complete a few missions with federal credits as reparations. As a Saint blacksmith, he could directly request what kind of reparations he wanted for his work, rather than having to choose missions for himself. No problem. That can certainly be arranged. The young woman immediately replied, despite the slightly surprised look that had appeared on her face. She was feeling rather perplexed. One had to realize that all Saint blacksmiths were extremely wealthy. When had there ever been a Saint blacksmith who was short on federal credits? Generally speaking, most Saint blacksmiths would only accept missions when they required some rare materials. Otherwise, just the high-grade soul masters who were looking to become three-word battle armor masters would be more than enough to keep them busy. Furthermore, a Saint blacksmith would virtually ask for anything in repayment for their services, as long as the terms weren't too absurd. This was why high-grade blacksmiths were held in higher regard than high-grade mecha makers, mechanics, and designers. They were simply far too rare. A list of missions was presented to Tang Wuling, and there were no corresponding prices as the prices would be proposed by the Saint blacksmiths themselves. That's right, the Saint blacksmith would ask to be paid what they wanted. This was almost absurd in a way, but these were the rules of the blacksmith association. Even though Tang Wuling had been a Saint blacksmith for a very long time, this was the first time that he had received such treatment. It appeared that money wouldn't be an issue now. Just select three missions that can be completed by seventh rank Saint blacksmiths, and as for the price, I'll charge the same as the market price. You can determine the prices after you evaluate the metals that I forge. Give me a forging room and the required materials, and I'll get started right away. Yes. Service was always extremely fast and convenient for a Saint Blacksmith. After making these decisions, everything would be taken care of for him by the association. The material costs would be deducted from the final reparations that he received, and all of the materials chosen for him were definitely going to be the best. For a Saint Blacksmith, material costs were virtually negligible. Thus, three missions were quickly presented to Tang Walin. All three missions were of the same type, and they were ones that Saint Blacksmiths faced the most. They were soul refined metal molding missions. To put it in simpler terms, these missions required one to soul refine metals, then mold them into whatever shape or form that was required. To put it in even simpler terms, these missions revolved around creating fundamental pieces of three-word battle armor. A faint smile appeared on Tang Walin's face at the sight of these three missions. All three were soul refined metal molding missions, which were the simplest missions that Saint Blacksmiths could complete. It was quite clear that the young woman had been quite reserved in her choices as Tang Walin was an unfamiliar face that she had never seen before. However, this wasn't necessarily a bad thing. He hadn't forged for quite a while, so it would be good for him to practice with these relatively simple missions. Soon, a string of rhythmic clangs rang out from within a high-grade forging room. The sound was very crisp and pleasant, and was completely devoid of any violence. The expression on the face of the employee who was standing outside immediately eased upon hearing the sound. Ulan had been working on the Saint Blacksmith floor for over three years, yet she had only seen a total of six Saint Blacksmiths during this time. When she saw Tang Wuling, the first thing she did was try to verify his identity, but there were no records in the system of a Saint Blacksmith like him. However, through their scanning devices, it could be determined that his Saint Blacksmith badge was authentic, and it was also most definitely his. However, there was no way for her to inquire about Tang Wuling's situation without encroaching upon his privacy. So she had been quite reserved in her mission choices and chose the three simplest missions for Tang Wuling. As soon as she heard the pleasant clangs coming from his forging room. She was immediately assured that this was indeed a Saint Blacksmith. If he went a Saint Blacksmith, there was no way that he could make his forging sound so captivating and delightful. Furthermore, this man was most likely a veteran Saint Blacksmith who was possibly quite close to reaching the eighth rank. He appeared to be in his forties, but generally speaking, all blacksmiths worked extremely hard, so they often didn't age very well and looked older than they actually were. As such, perhaps he wasn't even forty years old yet. Even if he was slightly older than her, she could certainly accept such a young Saint Blacksmith. After all, if she could become a Saint Blacksmith woman, Ulan was already getting carried away by her train of thought. In contrast, Tang Wuling had already entered a highly concentrated state of complete immersion. As his powers had improved, especially from the enhancements of his Golden Dragon King bloodline, Tang Wuling discovered that his entire being could be integrated into his forging, even his bloodline aura. What was the difference between a seventh rank and an eighth rank blacksmith. The difference lay in whether one could infuse their own aptitude into the metals that they forged, thereby bestowing upon the metals aptitude, on top of life and sentience. Tang Walin was still lacking in this regard, which was why he was still a seventh rank blacksmith. In order to accomplish this, he required more practice and enlightenment, as well as to constantly better his understanding of himself and his own forging. For example, his teacher, Saint Blacksmith Mu Chen, would already impart some of the special characteristics of his son martial soul into the metals that he refined. As such, the soul refined metals that he forged were most suitable for fire attribute soul masters, or soul masters who didn't possess martial souls with attributes that clashed with the fire element. If a suit of three word were to be constructed using his soul refined metals, the battle armor would possess an innate fire attribute, thereby adding extremely potent fire attribute power to the soul masters' attacks without any additional soul power expenditure. This was the equivalent of giving the battle armor master a brand new ability. And that was certainly nothing to be scoffed at. Tang Walin was also at a stage where he was beginning to try and master this ability. Prior to today, he had only developed a slight inkling for how he was going to accomplish this, but he was still very far away from being able to infuse his aptitude into the metals that he forged. However, he was feeling different today. He could immediately sense that he was somehow different as soon as he began his forging. Chapter 1135. There were all types of elements dancing around him in an elated manner in the surrounding space, and he could clearly sense the changes taking place in the metal elements. His spirit domain realm spiritual power allowed him to experience all of these changes in greater depth, and as he forged, all of the natural elements around him were actually also constantly affecting the piece of metal before him. He could even sense that as he breathed, his bloodline fluctuations was also affecting the metal that he was forging. This was a benefit of possessing immense spiritual power, and the benefits of having enormous spiritual power could manifest themselves in almost all aspects of a soul master's abilities. Possessing tremendous spiritual power enhanced one greatly both in battle and in their secondary occupations. As such, almost all soul masters who excelled in their secondary occupations also possessed high levels of spiritual power. Even so, there were very few Saint Blacksmiths who had reached the spirit domain realm. For example, Tang Walin's teacher, Saint Blacksmith Mu Chen, was only at the spirit of this realm, and that was already enough. For a blacksmith. Tang Walin was using his spirit domain realm spiritual power to sense the intricacies of his forging, and he was completely immersed in sensing the metal that was being forged. He had become one with the metal that he was forging, and after reaching the soul refinement level, every soul refinement that was completed involved bestowing upon a piece of metal life and intelligence. This was why high end blacksmiths were far rarer than mecha makers, designers, and mechanics. A metallic life form with life and intelligence could be used to construct battle armor or makers, but that was purely a molding process. While the forging process was one of creation, Tang Walin had been a Saint blacksmith for quite a while now, and he possessed exceptional aptitude
this moment was he truly beginning to take a step toward becoming an 8th rank saint blacksmith. His spirit domain realm spiritual power allowed him to communicate perfectly with each and every metal element, thereby allowing him to experience the differences between metal elements and other natural elements in greater depth. At the same time, these experiences were allowing him to constantly improve, and at this moment, he was like a parent to the metal that he was refining. He was constantly modifying this fetus through his forging, bestowing upon it his DNA. The forging process was quite lengthy and sustained, but as far Tang Wulin was aware, only a split second had passed. He only awakened from his immersion after a ray of gentle light and an excited burst of intelligent spiritual fluctuations washed over him, and he took a deep breath before withdrawing his soul refined heavy silver hammers. He looked at the piece of metal in front of him, and a faint smile appeared on his face. He reached out with his right hand and gently pressed it onto the silver metal, which appeared to be completely ordinary and mundane, and a startling turn of events immediately unfolded. The piece of silver metal suddenly softened, then climbed up along his fingertips before instantly covering his entire hand. Immediately thereafter, it flowed up his forearm, then his elbow, and finally concealed his entire arm as if it were a piece of armor. What was even more remarkable was that Tang Wuling could clearly sense the reference emanating from the piece of metal. It was like a child who was joyfully showing off its abilities to its father. A layer of rhomboid scales instantly appeared over the surface of the piece of metal at Tang Wuling's behest, and those scale patterns resembled the shape of his golden dragon scales. The scales were extremely lifelike, and they were even capable of opening and closing. Tang Wuling raised his arm, and a faint smile appeared on his face. He no longer needed to forge the metal any further to complete the molding process. All he had to do was pull it to take on any shape he wanted. The only problem was that he was now feeling quite reluctant to part with it. Each and every piece of soul refined metal that he forged felt like his child, and he really didn't want to give his children away to other people. It was no wonder that teacher Yu Chen had told him that the higher the color of the blacksmith, the more reluctant they generally were to sell their creations. The forging missions were quickly completed, and they were very simple jobs for Saint blacksmiths. But due to the fact that these were soul refined metals, they were still going to fetch an astronomical sum. Furthermore, the man far outweighed supply in the market for soul refined metals. By the time he emerged from the forging room, night had already fallen. He didn't spend all of this time on forging. A large chunk of his time had also been spent on thinking and feeling. His schedule had been extremely packed of late, and it was a rare opportunity to be able to ponder his own forging in such great depth like this. The forging missions that he had completed had allowed him to reap many valuable rewards. He could even sense that once he could completely integrate his spirit domain realm spiritual power into his forging, then he would definitely be able to become an eighth rank blacksmith. This was a level that countless blacksmiths have pursued for their entire lifetimes without any luck. The employee carried the refined metals from Tang Wuling to a designated testing room for an in-depth examination. Soul refined metals were extremely rare and fetched astronomical prices. If a counterfeit piece of soul refined metal were to be sold, the blacksmith association would suffer severe repercussions, both in their finances and in their reputation. Tang Wuling was taken to a VIP resting suite to wait, and he took the opportunity to further ponder the rewards that he'd reaped from his forging. Not long after that, someone knocked on the door of his suite, and on this occasion, it was an elderly man who had come to see him as opposed to the young woman from before. The old man's eyes were practically glowing, and his gaze settled on Tang Wuling as soon as he walked into the room. May I ask your name? I recognize most of the Saint blacksmiths in our federation, but forgive me for not being able to identify you. The old man cut straight to the chase. With Tang Wuling's experience, he was quickly able to deduce that this man was most likely also a Saint blacksmith, and there was a good chance that he was the president of this blacksmith association branch. Otherwise, he wouldn't be speaking on equal terms with Tang Wuling despite being aware that he was a Saint blacksmith. Tang Wuling smiled and replied, I only just became a Saint blacksmith not long ago, and my teacher is the esteemed divine blacksmith, Zen Hua. My teacher prohibited me from showing off my skills prior to reaching a level that he deemed to be acceptable, and I've only just satisfied his requirements not long ago. He removed the Saint blacksmith badge hanging from his chest as he spoke before offering it to the old man. The man accepted the badge, and a respectful look immediately appeared on his face. He was naturally able to sense that this was a badge that had been created by a legendary divine blacksmith. The old man chuckled, I see, so you're a disciple of the president. It's no wonder that you can create such exceptional soul refined metals. Then, my name is Yao Ling, and I was fortunate enough to have been given the honor of becoming the president of the Bright Sea Blacksmith Association branch. May I ask your name? Tang Wuling smiled and said, My name is Gu Yue. He had initially planned to call himself Long Yue, Dragon Moon, but for some reason, he reflexively used Gu Yue's name, and the slip of the tongue left him feeling a little forlorn. Gu Yue. Sure enough, Yao Ling had never heard this name before. It appears that this was a disciple that the president had kept a secret from everyone. He appeared to only be around 40 years of age at most, but from the medals he had refined, it was clear that he was already very close to becoming an 8th rank saint blacksmith. In fact, he could already be an 8th rank saint blacksmith and simply wasn't able to display his true abilities as the forging missions given to him were too simple. Welcome to our bright city branch, Brother Gu. Please do stay for a few days so we can communicate and exchange some ideas. By the way, I haven't met the president for a long time. How is he? Yao Ling asked. Chapter 1136. A wry smile appeared on Tang Wuling's face. I also haven't seen teacher for quite a while. My apologies, President Yao, but I have some things that I must take care of, so I won't be able to stay for too long. I'll be sure to converse with you and exchange ideas the next time I come here. A disappointed look appeared on Yao Ling's face. That truly is a pity. I really wanted to exchange some ideas with you. I just examined your soul refined metals and was greatly inspired. At the same time, I could tell that your skills exceed mine in some areas. Also, I wanted to discuss something with you. Would you be able to give your soul refined metals to me? The association will still pay you the same reparations for the missions, and I'll forge some soul refined metals myself for the buyers. A hint of surprise appeared on Tang Wuling's face upon hearing this. It was quite clear that Yao Ling wanted to keep his soul refined metals for further research. This wasn't a big issue, and it certainly wasn't a bad thing that Yao Ling held him in such high regard. No problem. I hope my medals can be of help to you. Yao Ling nodded with a pleased expression before hurriedly departing after exchanging contact details with Tang Wuling. Even though Yao Ling and Yu Chen were both Saint Blacksmiths, the former was the president of the Bright City Blacksmith Association branch. So in reality, it could be said that his status in the association was second only to that of Zen Hua. For someone of his lofty status to take the initiative to seek out Tang Wuling was a testament to just how much Tang Wuling's soul refined medals had inspired him. The arrival of any Saint Blacksmith to the association branch was a major event, and after the employee verified Tang Wuling's abilities as a Saint Blacksmith, she immediately took his soul refined medals to Yao Ling for inspection. Yao Ling wasn't all that surprised to hear that a Saint Blacksmith had come to visit their branch. After all, Bright City was now the number one city on the entire continent. So while Saint Blacksmith visits were still rare, they were certainly far from unheard of. However, he was given a massive shock upon seeing Tang Wuling's soul refined medals as a veteran. Saint Blacksmith, he was far more sensitive to metals than normal people, and the first feeling that he was struck by was that these were extraordinary creations. Setting aside everything else, just the conception imbued within these pieces of metal far exceeded that of the soul refined metals forged by the vast majority of Saint Blacksmiths. In his eyes, the forging techniques used were still a little rough around the edges, but this blacksmith clearly excelled in his understanding of metals, as well as in the process of bestowing upon metals life and intelligence. The vitality imbued within these pieces of metal clearly far exceeded that of the vast majority of Saint Blacksmiths, and even he couldn't do much better. This was the symbol of an eighth rank Saint Blacksmith. Even more importantly, this method of bestowing life upon metals was different from the method that he normally used, and that was even extremely rare. As
Mechas weren't all that rare, and all major powers had a supply of them. However, what allowed Zen to his Mecha to stand about and rise above the rest? His Mecha was special, because he had put countless effort into crafting it, and it had been entirely constructed from heavenly refined metals. This was no longer just a simple Mecha, it could be said that it was his personal guardian. Yao Ling had been an 8th rank Saint blacksmith for many years already, and there was nothing more important to him than progressing to the divine blacksmith level. This was why he was so eager to seek out Tang Wu Ling to see if they could exchange some ideas. Furthermore, he was also hoping to be able to keep the soul refined metals that Tang Wu Ling had forged, and thankfully, his request was granted. Tang Wu Ling departed from the blacksmith association building after being given a massive sum of money, and a smile naturally appeared on his face. Perhaps it was because it had been an extremely arduous process for him to save up money to buy his first soul spirit as a child, but he was still unable to shrug off his own stinginess. It was already quite late at this point, and Tang Wu Ling didn't return to the hotel. Instead, he went to a restaurant to have a meal. Right at this moment, the ringtone of his soul communicator sounded, and he glanced at it to find that the caller was the manager of the Tang Sex Bright City branch, Ji Chi. His heart stirred slightly upon seeing this, and he accepted the call. Ji Chi? It's me. I've gotten into contact with Ems. Mo Lan and passed on your message to her. She has agreed to meet you tomorrow at noon at a cafe near the Parliament building. All right, tell me the address. After ending the call, Tang Wu Ling was struck by a sense of reminiscence. In reality, it had only been a few years since he had last seen Mo Lan, but those few years had been like an entire lifetime, and both of them had experienced far too many things. Many major events that had changed them to an extreme degree had taken place during the past few years, and Tang Wu Ling could only hear a faint sigh at the thought of the tragedies that had befallen Mo Lan. After paying the bill and emerging from the restaurant, Tang Wu Ling strolled along the streets of Bright City. Bright City was now the largest city on the entire continent, and due to how early it had been developed, the central region of the city was extremely packed. The buildings in the area were looking rather squashed, and there were countless skyscrapers in all directions. Even though it was already very late into the night, the city was still as brightly lit as it were daytime. The people who had a tiring day of work were now clearly a lot more relaxed as they walked on the city streets, and there were many inebriated young couples walking together in an intimate fashion. Some of them let Lucy yell from time to time as if they were venting the fatigue and frustrations they'd accumulated during the day. Tang Wu felt as if it would be very difficult for him to integrate himself into this world of iron and steel. He couldn't help but think back to his life at Shrek Academy. He loved the simple and pure environment in the academy, far removed from the deceitful and shady environments that one would often find in society. Unfortunately, the academy no longer existed, and he could think back to his experiences there as wonderful past memories. Thinking back now, even the fights against Lucy and the others have been such enjoyable experiences. A God Slayer missile had erased all of this. He could still recall the scenes back when Lucy had confessed to him. Now, everything had been reduced to dust. Lucy no longer existed, and countless peers of his had most likely been wiped off the face of this world during the bombing. Tang reflexively clenched his fists. He had never hated anything like he hated the Holy Spirit cult before. This was no longer just a personal vendetta, it was a vendetta that belonged to Shrek Academy and even the entire human race. The fact that the Holy Spirit cult dared to attack the Blood God Legion clearly indicated that their goal was to destroy the entire human race, and in order to accomplish this goal, they were even willing to release the abyssal plane into this world. Just as Tang Wu Ling was walking, his shoulder suddenly bumped into something, and he faltered slightly before reflexively raising his head. He had gotten lost in his own thoughts and unintentionally bumped into a passerby on the street. The person that he had bumped into was clearly quite inebriated, and after bumping into him, she immediately began to fall sideways. Tang Wu Ling reached out to grab her before supporting her into a standing position. The strong scent of alcohol immediately wafted toward him alongside the woman's natural bodily fragrance, and it wasn't a very pleasant concoction, but it was rather alluring in a sense. Tang Wu Ling's brows furrowed slightly as he looked at the woman who had practically fallen onto him. Her eyes were a little bleary and out of focus as she stared at Tang Wu Ling, and she pressed her hands against Tang Wu Ling's chest. W H, what are you doing? Get away from me! Tang Wu Ling helped her into an upright position. Be more careful when you're walking. After giving her that brief piece of advice, he released her and prepared to leave. He didn't like the smell of alcohol, especially when it was coming from a woman in such a potent dose. Alcohol was something that was very unfamiliar to Tang Wu Ling, but he knew that it could numb someone, and it was undoubtedly unsafe for a woman to drink so much, especially with all of the shady individuals roaming the city streets at this late hour. Even though he had only taken a fleeting glance at her, he could tell that the woman was quite an exceptional beauty. Her looks were quite stunning, and her figure was also very exceptional. She wore a singlet and a pair of denim shorts, revealing a pair of long and fair legs. There was a pair of high heels on her feet, and her long hair had been arranged into a simple ponytail that trailed down the back of her head. Her cheeks were quite flushed, and she was wearing some heavy makeup, including blue eyeliner. However, the makeup didn't look excessive and vulgar, and this was most likely an indication that it was very high-quality makeup. Chapter 1137 this was an extremely attractive and scantily clad young woman who was in an inebriated state. It was difficult for passers by not to pay attention to her, and if she were to encounter some sinister individuals, she would be in some trouble. However, Tang Wu Ling wasn't interested in sticking his nose into other people's business. She was dressed like this and had gotten herself intoxicated to this extent, so perhaps a one night stand was what she was looking for anyway. In any case, he was certainly in no place to do anything about this. As such, he turned around to leave, yet right at this moment, an enraged voice suddenly sounded beside his ears. Where the hell are you, you bastard? When are you going to get out of my dreams? Tang Wu Ling's footsteps faltered upon hearing this. He was suddenly struck by a sense of familiarity upon hearing this voice, and he seemed to have heard similar interrogative words in the past. He reflexively turned toward the woman again, and right at this moment, five or six young men in colorful attire caught up to her. The man at the forefront of the group wore a yellow singlet with a pair of floral shorts and expensive looking sandals. Haha, ha, I'm here for ya, little cutie. Why were you in such a hurry to leave? Didn't you say you were going to the bathroom? What are you doing here? Let's go back and drink some more. The man quickly strode forward before latching onto the woman's arm as he spoke. Let go of me. I don't want to drink anymore. I'm telling you, you better get away from me. I'm from the M. Military. The woman seemed to have retained a shred of consciousness, and she violently shrugged off the young man, causing him to stumble back unsteadily. The man wasn't hurt in the slightest by this. Instead, he chuckled, You're from the military? That's great. My dad's a member of parliament, we make a perfect match. Come on, brothers, help her back to the restaurant, and let's drink some more. The other young men in the group also approached the young woman with sly grins on their faces. The military? Tang Wu Ling's heart stirred slightly as he looked at the young woman, and he finally began to realize who she was. Was it really her? He was struggling to reconcile her current image with the image as a cold and forbidding female military official. If it were really her, then wouldn't the bastard that she was referring to be him? A peculiar look appeared on Tang Wu Ling's face, and he gave a resigned shrug. Seeing as this was someone that he knew, he couldn't just stand by idly and watch. In any case, it would be a simple matter for him to help her out anyway. With that in mind, he quickly strode forward before gently tapping his left foot onto the ground, and a gentle burst of shockwaves instantly proliferated forth. All of the young men's bodies instantly stiffened, and they were rooted to the spot. These were just ordinary people, and not only had the shockwaves immobilized them, even their thoughts had been scattered. Tang Wu Ling latched onto the young woman, and he didn't seem to be moving very quickly. But the two of them soon disappeared after veering into another street. Only after several seconds had passed, did the group of young men return to normal. Where'd she go? Where is she? The young man in the yellow singlet immediately fled up with rage. Unbeknownst to him, even though Tang Wu Ling had taken the woman away,
A middle aged woman who was passing by approached Tang Wuling with an appalled expression. Tang Wuling sighed. This daughter of mine is constantly going out drinking and hanging out with shady characters, so I have to teach her a lesson. Can you smell the alcohol on her? I swear she'll be the death of me. NGH, WH, who's your? The woman was already returning to her senses under the stream of icy cold water, and she wanted to yell out, but was unable to say anything. Streams of water were being forced into her nose and mouth under Tang Wuling's control, thereby forcing her words back. The middle aged woman's expression immediately changed upon hearing this, and she adopted a critical expression as she scoffed. The young people these days really are getting more and more unruly. I support you. What you're doing is right. Tang Wuling currently had the appearance of a middle aged man, so no one was suspecting his claim to be the woman's father. After being blasted with cold water for a full ten minutes, the woman's consciousness was beginning to fade once again, and only then did Tang Wuling pull her head out of the faucet. He waved her hand through the air, and a gentle burst of soul power forced the water out of her hair. He then dragged her out of the public restroom and onto the street again. Shen Xing was shivering as she was dragged out into the open. The water from the tap was very cold, and she had thrown up most of the alcohol that she had ingested, so she was finally fully conscious now. However, her hair was still quite damp, and her entire head was numb from the cold water. Her body was trembling, and her lips were pale and devoid of blood, but she was finally able to clearly see the man standing before her. You, you. After being blasted by water for so long, her heavy makeup had already been cleansed away, revealing a set of facial features that were far more beautiful than her original appearance. It really was her. Tang Wuling wore a resigned expression as he said, If you're conscious now, then go home. A girl like you shouldn't be drinking so much. He then turned to leave. He didn't have any duty to take care of her, and he only stepped in as he didn't want to see her get into any trouble. Stop right there. Shen Xing suddenly yelled. However, Tang Wuling completely ignored her and continued to walk away. A hint of fury flashed through her eyes, and her body abruptly flashed as a series of soul rings emerged from beneath her feet. She now had a total of five soul rings, and she was extraordinarily fast, appearing in front of Tang Wuling to block his path in an instant. Do you need something? Tang Wuling appraised her with a calm expression. Shen Xing was panting slightly, but as her soul power circulated within her body, the inebriation and cold sensation was quickly fading away. Who are you? Why is it that I don't recognize you, but you seem so familiar to me? As an outstanding prodigy in the military, Shen Xing had grown up in a military family her entire life, and now that she had fully regained her consciousness, she was immediately able to sense that something was amiss. This mundane looking middle aged man that she'd definitely never met before somehow struck her with an indescribable sense of familiarity. Furthermore, her sixth sense was very sharp, and she could clearly sense that she would regret letting this man go. All of a sudden, golden light began to shimmer from within Tang Wuling's eyes. Sometimes, it's best not to know everything. He raised a hand and extended it toward Shen Xing as he spoke. Shen Xing faltered momentarily, and she reflexively tried to evade. In her eyes, there was no way that he would be able to resist a fibering sulking like her, and she was going to detain this man before figuring out who he was. However, she was then stunned to discover that she was somehow unable to evade this simple looking palm no matter what she tried. She could only look on as his palm struck her forehead, and her vision turned black as she slumped to the ground. However, in that instant, Shen Xing's mind suddenly became extremely clear. That familiar aura, that familiar voice at the end, and those familiar golden eyes. It was him. She was yelling with all her might in her heart, but she was unable to utter so much as a single sound. The blackness in her vision persisted for close to 20 seconds before she could see again, and by then, Tang Wuling was long gone. He was here. He had come to Bright City. This thought immediately appeared in her mind. Ever since Shen Xing had returned to Bright City from the North Sea Legion, her nightmares had begun once again. In the beginning, they were rather abstract and indistinct, but they were becoming clearer and clearer. She was clearly supposed to be full of hatred toward the man who had taken her as hostage in the past, but for some reason, she was unable to muster up any anger toward him. What was even more unsettling was that she had developed many unimaginable emotions toward him. The fact that she was dreaming of him every single night was a testament to just how much of an impression he had left on her, and as a result, she was suffering from severe insomnia, to the extent that she was unable to fall asleep without the assistance of alcohol. Chapter 1138 this was why she had gradually developed an alcohol problem, but she didn't think that she would bump into him again under these circumstances. He was in Bright City. Bright City was very large, but it was certainly a smaller area to scour through than the entire Dulu continent. Furthermore, the status of the Shen family in Bright City would allow her to draw upon a lot of power to try and find him. She had to find him no matter what. The thought of finding the man who had played her dreams every night struck her with a sense of excitement, which had been absent from her life for a very long time. She had to find him and make him beg for mercy on his knees. Then, then, she hadn't thought about what she was going to do after that yet, but all she wanted to do right now was to capture that abhorrent bastard. After organizing her damp long hair, an unprecedentedly determined look appeared in Shenzing's eyes. To Tang Wuling, meeting Shenzing was nothing more than a minor interlude. After that chance encounter, he returned to his hotel room and immediately began to meditate. Cultivation had become the most enjoyable daily activity for him, partially because he was currently able to make progress at a phenomenal rate. Even more importantly, only during his cultivation could he completely relax his mind and better sense everything in the outside world. The forging he had completed earlier had given him many new feelings, and he now had a better understanding of his own spirit domain realm spirit power. The spirit domain realm was the absolute upper limit for soul masters, and no one was even sure what the spiritual power at the threshold of the spirit domain realm was. The only thing that everyone knew was that it was virtually impossible to advance beyond the spirit domain realm, even for the and it was most likely the case that only true gods would be able to reach the divine origin realm. A peaceful night passed by, and Tang Wuling gave his debit card to Long Yakshu the next morning so she could purchase some daily necessities for everyone. Having a vice captain like her truly alleviated much of the load on his shoulders. As for what he was going to do next, Tang Wuling already had a plan. After getting into contact with Mulan in Bright City, he was going to leave with everyone as soon as possible and return to the original side of Shrek City. It was undoubtedly the case that the areas near Shrek City, including Heaven No City, would have been impacted by Shrek Academy the most in the past, so he should be able to find more Shrek Academy supporters there. After having some breakfast, Tang Wuling arrived near the cafe where Mulan had agreed to meet him quite early. He didn't immediately enter the cafe upon his arrival. Instead, he walked a lap around the cafe first. He didn't disguise himself today, but he had worn a large wide brim hat that concealed his facial features. After conducting a brief inspection of the area, then using his spiritual power to verify that nothing was amiss nearby. He stood still in a corner on the side of the street and silently awaited the arrival of the agreed meeting time. It was always better to be safe than sorry. This was a valuable lesson that the old demons had taught him. Even the slightest moment of complacency could spell his downfall, so he had to constantly be vigilant. Tang Wuling knew that he carried an extremely heavy responsibility on his shoulders, and he couldn't truly rely on anyone but himself. As such, he was constantly in a cautious and careful state, and would take the safest route as soon as he discovered anything amiss. Would you like to buy some cigarettes, sir? A salesman passed by Tang Wuling with his tobacco cart. Tang Wuling glanced at him before waving a hand in refusal, and the salesman continued on his way. Right at this moment, Tang Wuling caught sight of a familiar figure in the distance. Her figure was still quite slender, and she looked very sharp and professional in her black suit. However, her gentle and beautiful features had been marred by the passage of time, and even though they had only been apart for a short few years, it was as if she had aged a full ten years. There was a young woman following along close behind her. The young woman was also quite tall and slender. She appeared to be around 170 centimeters in height and was wearing a set of simple white activewear. What was quite noteworthy was that her hair was also white, and only her eyes were blue, thereby creating a rather peculiar sight to behold. Even Tang
Tang Wuling called out in a gentle voice. Mo Lan was unable to hold back her tears any longer, and they instantly gushed out of her eyes as she grabbed onto Tang Wuling's hand. I'm so happy to see you. She was barely able to speak through her sobs. The waiter was clearly aware that this was a special moment between the two, and he immediately departed from their table, leaving Tang Wuling and Mo Lan staring at one another. Mo Lan was unable to hold back her tears no matter how hard she tried. She was constantly telling herself to be strong, but the floodgates were completely thrown open at the sight of Tang Wuling, who had saved her life once before, and she broke down into sobs. Tang Wuling held onto her hands, and no words could describe what the two of them had been through during the past few years. Mo Lan had lost the people closest to her, and that was also the case for Tang Wuling. The white-haired woman was initially rather surprised to see Mo Lan breaking down into sobs, but she then quickly furrowed her brows and made her way over to Mo Lan's side before handing her a tissue. Mo Lan accepted the tissue to wipe away her tears, and it took her a lot of effort to stabilize her emotions. I didn't think that I would be able to meet you again. It was a simple sentence, but her words were filled with boundless bitterness. Tang Wuling didn't say anything and merely held tightly onto her hands. Only now was Mo Lan able to inspect him closely, and she could see that he was clearly taller, more muscular, and more handsome than before. His back was ramrod straight, and he was well and truly an adult. However, Mo Lan's heart throbbed with pain at the sight of the maturity in Tang Wuling's eyes, which completely belied his age. She then thought back to the ordeals that he had suffered through, and she knew that he had suffered through no less pain than she had. As the daughter of a high-ranking official of Heaven Do City, she had constantly been keeping tabs on Tang Wuling, who was a student of Shrek Academy. He disappeared for three years on the Star Luo continent, but following his return, he quickly became the leader of Shrek's Seven Monsters. This information was known by very few outsiders, but Mo Lan was aware of all of this. It had been around five years since they had last met, and Tang Wuling had grown up. However, his current level of maturity had come at the expense of his past exuberance and naivety. How many painful experiences did he have to go through before reaching this point? I thought you were already. Tears began to well up in Mo Lan's eyes again. Tang Wuling consoled. It's all right. I'm still alive and thriving. Mo Lan nodded emphatically as tears began to flow down her face again. Tang Wuling gently swayed her hands as he said, seeing as we're both alive, those people have to pay for what they've done. We have to put an end to them, both for ourselves and for the sake of the entire human race. Mo Lan's tears almost instantly ceased upon hearing this, and an astonishingly hateful look appeared in her eyes. She wasn't even aware of the fact that her fingernails had dug into Tang Wuling's palms. That's right. They must pay. This is not the right place to speak. Come with me. Mo Lan led Tang Wuling out of the cafe as she spoke. Chapter 1139. Right at this moment, both Tang Wuling and the white-haired woman's expressions changed slightly, and they cast their eyes toward the entrance of the cafe. Slam! The doors of the cafe were thrown open, and a dozen or so uniformed soldiers holding soul laser guns rushed into the room. They aimed their guns at the customers in the cafe, and a wave of alarmed cries instantly rang out. Tang Wuling's eyes narrowed slightly, and he was clearly rather perplexed by the situation. From these soldiers' uniforms and equipment, it was quite clear that they were from the military. Why had they suddenly appeared here? Could it be that they had come here for Mo Lan? A dozen or so soldiers naturally wasn't a cause for alarm, but this was Bright City, and only the most exceptional soldiers were stationed here. Whenever they appeared on a scene, it was very likely that major trouble was going to follow. No matter how powerful he was, it would be very difficult for him to save Mo Lan if the military were determined to play against her. We're here on official military orders. Everyone, put your hands on your heads and don't move. We're here to search for the suspect of a crime. The cafe wasn't very large, and with the influx of a dozen or so soldiers, it was virtually completely packed. Tang Wuling wore a heavy expression as he appraised the soldiers. At the same time, countless thoughts were quickly racing through his mind. Could it be that someone from the Tang sect had leaked this information? Was there a spy under Ji? Alternatively, could it be that someone under Mo Lan had spread the word? Stop. Right at this moment, Mo Lan strode over to the soldiers who were preparing to search through the customers. She wore an enraged look on her face, and she interrogated, which department are you from? Who gave you permission to search for suspects in a public setting like this? Where is your official military warrant? Where is it? Show me. Tang Wuling was standing right beside Mo Lan, and he was surprised to discover that she had truly become different from her past self. In the past, she was strong, brave, and selfless, but she clearly didn't possess such an overbearing side at the time. Her aura alone was rather intimidating, even to him. The soldiers that were about to spring into action instantly faltered slightly upon hearing her interrogation, and Tang Wuling almost reflexively positioned himself in front of Mo Lan, shielding her from the soul laser guns being aimed at her. What right do you have to be asking these questions? A second lieutenant asked in a cold voice, Search this place. We'll be held responsible if the suspect gets away. Mo Lan harumped in an enraged manner, over my dead body. Does the military just do what it wants now? You're being paid by the Federation to protect the general public, not to enforce tyranny on the people. Let me see who's abusing their power like this. Little Bai, make a call to the Bright City Police Station and report the situation here. Willing, disarm all of these people and make sure none of them get away. I'm not going to let this slide unless the military provides a legitimate explanation for this. Mo Lan's overbearing demeanor immediately made the second lieutenant have second thoughts about his actions. If he had thought that Mo Lan was only bluffing before, then he definitely no longer thought this now. If she were only bluffing, then how could she be putting on such a convincing display? Don't move. He hurriedly yelled in a thunderous voice. He had to control the situation. However, right at this moment, Tang Wuling had already sprung into action. He used the same tactic he used the night before to immobilize those shady young men, stomping his right foot gently into the ground. With his ultra-powerful spiritual power, he was able to direct the offensive force of his golden dragon shakes the earth right under the feet of the dozen or so soldiers with unerring accuracy. And the second lieutenant's voice abruptly cut off. In the next instant, Tang Wuling circled his arms together, unleashing his controlling crane capturing dragon to gather all of the soldiers together before dumping them onto the ground of the cafe. Only then did Tang Wuling stride over to confiscate their soul laser guns, then struck all of them with his palms to seal off their bloodlines. After he did all this, the white-haired woman hadn't even finished dialing the number for the police station. Mo Lan had always known that Tang Wuling was very powerful. After all, it was none other than Tang Wuling who had saved that entire train, and he had also gone on to become the leader of the generation of Shrek's seven monsters. Even so, Mo Lan didn't think that Tang Wuling would be this powerful already. A faint smile appeared on Tang Wuling's face, and he turned around before giving Mo Lan a reassuring nod. At this point, the call to the police station had already been made, and Mo Lan turned to everyone within the cafe as she said, Don't panic, everyone, please give me some of your time and attention. I'm Parliament Member Mo Lan, and I guarantee all of you that you're safe right now. I'll be sure to force the military to release an official statement on the unjust treatment everyone received here, and I apologize on behalf of the Federation. Mo Lan extended a bow toward everyone as she spoke. Mo Lan? The alarmed customers in the cafe were instantly a lot more reassured after hearing this name, and some of them had even begun conversing among themselves. It was quite clear that they had heard Mo Lan's name before. Mo Lan had consoled the customers, and Little Bai had also finished making her call. However, right at this moment, a deep rumbling noise suddenly sounded outside. With Tang Wuling's understanding of modern weaponry, he was naturally able to immediately identify this as the sound that makers made during landings. Following the turn of events that had just unfolded, Tang Wuling was able to verify one thing: those soldiers had most likely not been sent out to target Mo Lan. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been intimidated by her. In that case, who were they targeting? During his prior observation, he had already ascertained that there were no other soul masters in the cafe aside from Little Bai and himself. Could it be that they were targeting him? Right at this moment, a voice
An intimidating voice sounded from within the Mecca. Molan was completely unfazed as she yelled in an enraged manner. Mecca's are major military weapons. Were they assigned to you just so you could threaten the general public? I'm going to report you to the federal parliament for this. Little why? Record the number plates. All military Mechas had a unique number assigned to them, which made it more convenient for the military to manage them. This is your last opportunity. Put your hands on your head. Mecha pilots were of a far higher status than normal soldiers, so it was quite clear that these Mecha masters hadn't been intimidated by Molan. Right at this moment, loud police sirens sounded on the streets, and the sound was approaching this direction. The police force was here. Tang Jihao's expression changed slightly as he sat in his purple Mecha. The military didn't fear the police force, and they were ranked far above the police department, but this was Bright City, and according to federal laws, the police force was responsible for maintaining law and order within the city. They were ordered to detain a certain person here, and if they could quickly complete their mission, then there naturally wouldn't be any issues. However, even though they weren't afraid of the police force, it would undoubtedly be troublesome if the police were to get involved, and most importantly, they would fail to capture their target. Chapter 1140. Captain, it's him. Right at this moment, the other purple maker suddenly raised a hand and pointed at Tang Walin. Tang Jihao immediately made a decision and yelled, Get him. The purple maker beside him raised its sole cannon and immediately unleashed a cannon blast. A ball of light shot forth out of the barrel before quickly exploding, forming a lightning net like attack that hurtled directly toward Tang Walin. Tang Walin stepped forward to shield Molan behind him. Sure enough, they really were targeting him. He had only just arrived at Bright City, so who could possibly be plotting against him? There definitely wasn't an issue in the Tang sect. If there were a spy in the Tang sect, they would be aware that he would be with a federal parliament member, and they definitely wouldn't deploy military units to try and capture him under broad daylight. If the problem hadn't arisen in the Tang sect, then could it be? The inebriated woman from the night before instantly surfaced in his mind. He lashed out with a direct and simple fist. A dull boom immediately rang out in the air, and he didn't use any skills or abilities. It was just an ordinary punch. However, the lightning net seemed to have encountered some kind of barrier in the face of his punch, and it was instantly stopped before fizzling out into nothingness. How dare you? Molan was both alarmed and enraged at the same time. Meanwhile, Little Bai didn't do anything. Her duty was to protect Molan, and she wasn't required to protect anyone else. Furthermore, Tang Wulin had taken care of a bunch of soldiers so easily in the cafe earlier, and she also wanted to see just what he was capable of. Two massive claymores crashed down toward Tang Wulin from both sides almost in complete unison. The two yellow makers had also sprung into action. Tang Jihao aimed his soul cannon toward Tang Wulin, and his thought process was very simple. All he had to do was capture Tang Wulin as quickly as possible, and his higher-ups would take care of all of the resulting repercussions. Thus, all four makers attacked Tang Wulin at once, both from long range and at close quarters. The fact that they were mega pilots in Bright City indicated that they were definitely all elite military soldiers, and they were extremely adept both in power and battle tactics. They were clearly more powerful than mega pilots of the same level, but they had no idea what kind of opponent they were facing. This was the dual champion king of the Star Battle Net Interfederation competition, also known as Golden Dragon King. He was touted as the most powerful being of the younger generation, and was the leader of Shrek 7 monsters. Clang, clang. The air seemed to have congealed as soon as the two claymores fell. All four mega pilots were completely stunned by what they were seeing. In the face of the two oncoming claymores, Tang Wulin didn't release his martial soul, nor his battle armor or mecha in retaliation. Instead, he did something extremely simple. He merely raised his arms and extended his hands outward. The pair of claymores then struck his palms, or in other words, he had reached out to grab the two claymores, which were crashing down with unstoppable force, and the explosive power generated was definitely in excess of ten tons. The two yellow mega pilots felt as if their mega's claymores had struck a peerlessly resolute chunk of metal rather than a human body. The two claymores came to an abrupt halt, and both of the mega pilots were stunned by the absurdity of the situation. How could a human body withstand the attacks of mechas without relying on any martial soul or weapons? Was this guy really a human? They were rooted to the spot in shock, but Tang Wulin certainly wasn't. In the next instant, he abruptly raised his arms, and the two yellow mechas were instantly hoisted up into the air before being slammed heavily onto the ground. At the same time, the yellow mecha's claymores were forcibly wrenched out of their hands, and Tang Wulin held them through the air as massive projectiles, which struck the cannon blasts from the two purple mechas with unerring accuracy. The cannon blasts were diverted up into the air as a result before exploding like dazzling fireworks, but were unable to harm Tang Wulin in the slightest. Even Little Bai, who had been appraising Tang Wulin with a cold expression this entire time, was completely flabbergasted. Was this guy really a human? In her eyes, Tang Wulin was like an almighty humanoid dragon. He had caught those two claymores with his bare hands, and she didn't sense any soul power being released from his body. This meant that he had crushed two yellow mechas and blocked the attacks from two purple mechas with nothing more than his bare hands and his physical strength. There was no way that this guy was human. Meanwhile, Tang Wulin had already risen up into the air, and he almost instantly appeared in front of Tang Jihao's purple mecha before he lashed out and kicked one of his mecha's knees. An explosive boom rang out from the knee joint of the massive purple mecha, and its leg was completely destroyed. Tang Wulin used its leg as a springboard to propel himself up into the air before slamming a fist into the purple mecha's waist. Boom! Tang Jihao could feel that his beloved mecha was toppling over to the side and hear the piercing sirens that had been set off, but he was still in a state of complete shock. He was a mecha squadron commander of the Bright City Garrison, and he possessed quite an abundance of battle experience, but he had never encountered an opponent like this before. This had to be a soul beast in human form. That was the only thought in Tang Jihao's mind. In the next instant, his mecha topped heavily onto the ground. At the same time, Tang Wulin forcibly changed directions in the air. Wind attribute elements converged toward him at his behest, carrying his body toward the final purple mecha in a maneuver that seemed to have completely broken the laws of physics. Boom! The soul cannon was finally fired once again, and the massive cannon blast instantly engulfed Tang Wulin's entire body. Mo Lan couldn't help but let loose an alarmed cry. She had indeed become a lot more assertive and overbearing than before, but she was still a woman. After all, without a martial soul to enhance herself, there was nothing that she could do. It was too late even for her to ask Little Bai to help him. However, in the next instant, her concern transformed into astonishment. From Mo Lan's perspective, it was as if the soul cannon blast that had struck Tang Wulin's body had instantly vanished without a trace. Tang Wulin emerged from the shockwaves of the cannon blast, hurtling toward the purple mecha like a shooting star. The mecha's protective barrier was activated to its full extent, and at the same time, it swung its left fist through the air. This purple mecha pilot's reactions were quite exceptional, but in the face of Tang Wulin's absolute power, anything he did was destined to be in vain. Boom. Tang Wulin's fist looked as if it had been carved out of pristine white jade, but it was imbued with downright terrifying explosive power. The purple mecha's protective barrier was destroyed, and even its metal fist was completely demolished while its massive body was tipped backward. Tang Wulin swung his left fist through the air, and as he did so, one could clearly see that the air surrounding his fist was compressed by an invisible force, thereby forming a layer of twisted light. Immediately thereafter, a thunderous boom erupted, and the purple mecha seemed to have been struck by a gigantic invisible sledgehammer, sending it flying backward before crashing heavily onto the ground. Air cannon. Of course, Tang Wulin hadn't actually mastered Yuan Anui's soul skill. He had merely emulated her ability through his pure strength. He had taken on four mechas on his own, and throughout the course of this entire battle, he had completely dominated the entire battlefield with nothing more than his strength and spiritual power. This had truly been a display of absolute crushing power. He landed gently onto the ground, and the four mechas had already been reduced to scrap metal. It was also right at this moment that the police vehicles arrived on the scene